Okay, I've been talking about simple roots and things without having defined them. So here's how we define them. Um, we pick a line or plane of irrational slope. In other words, a hyperplane in our uh, root diagram, which doesn't contain any of the points of the weight lattice other than the origin. So it passes through the origin. And that separates our roots into two groups. There's the negative roots on the left hand side and the positive roots on the right hand side. So I'm doing the negative roots in blue and the positive roots in black. So this is for the uh, A2 root system or um, uh, SU3 and this one is for the G2 root system. Now a root is called simple if it can't be written as a sum of two positive roots. I should really say a positive root is called simple if it can't be written as a sum of positive roots. So let's just have a look in these uh, examples. This root in the A2 root system can be written as this vector plus this vector. As you can see by the sort of parallelogram rule, if you go up here and then down here, you get to this root. So this guy is not simple. But these other two guys are simple. So this one's simple and this one's simple. In the G2 root system, this one at the top turns out to be simple. This one right at the bottom turns out to be simple. Um, these other ones are not simple, so how are we going to see that? Well, to get to this one, you go down to this root and then up. And up is a, a simple root. And then you can go up again, get to this one, and up again, and you get to this one. So none of these are simple. These are all sums of... Uh, sums of positive roots and uh, it's an exercise to see this is also not a simple root. So there are precisely two simple roots in this diagram as well. Okay, so we're going to prove some results about simple and non-simple roots. First of all, any positive root uh, can be written as a sum of simple roots. Well, proof. If your root is simple, then it's a sum of one simple root. So we're done. If not, then it's a sum of two positive roots. Let's give this root a name, alpha. Then alpha is uh, beta plus gamma for some positive roots. Uh, beta and gamma. And now we kind of proceed by induction. So if beta is simple and gamma is simple, then we're done. If not, then we some, you know, expand those as a sum of two positive roots. And how do we know this process terminates? Well, in this picture, let's look at the distance of these roots from our chosen hyperplane of irrational slope. Um, you see, if I have two positive roots uh, and I add them together, I get something which is further away, strictly further away from the hyperplane of irrational slope than the things I started with. That's because they're all all to the right of this hyperplane of irrational slope, so you know, they're all a positive distance away from it. Um, and if I add two of them, I just make that distance further. So this decreases the distance of the summands from the hyperplane of irrational slope.
and because we've uh, you know there's a lower bound on that distance this can't keep going forever this has to terminate and we end up expanding it as a sum of uh, simple roots this process has to terminate So this tells us that there are at least as many simple roots as there are dimensions of our root system. So this tells us there are at least uh, n simple roots where everything's happening in Rn because you know our, our root diagram spans Rn. Um, so and our, in particular the positive roots span Rn and they can all be written as a sum of simple roots, so we have to have at least n of them to span our n. So in a moment we'll show that there are at most n simple roots, so there are n simple roots. But first let's talk about the vial chamber. So um, I was saying that the vial chamber is like one of the segments of our, our n uh, cut out by these mirrors. Um, so how am I actually going to define the vial chamber? With respect to, uh, so this, this is assuming we've made a choice of this uh, line of irrational slope or this hyperplane of irrational slope. This is the set of points V in Rn such that alpha dot V is positive or zero, uh, so non-negative, for all positive roots alpha. So um, let me just draw a picture to illustrate this. So here's our example of the A2 root system. These black dots are the positive roots. Saying that you have positive dot product with, uh, let's say, this positive root, means that you are above this horizontal red line. Um, so in other words, you live in this part of the plane. Saying you have positive dot product with this guy is telling you that you live in this part of the plane. And finally, saying that you live, uh, that you have positive dot product with that guy is telling that you live on uh, the upper side of this final red line. So we need to take the intersection of those three regions. In other words, the region that's now coloured in green and pink and blue, which is precisely this bit. So this is the vial chamber. Now, actually, you saw in this picture, I didn't need to do that third one, right? That third blue region uh, didn't give me any extra information. I could have just taken the region that was coloured green and pink that would have already been the white vial chamber and that's because the vial chamber is also equal to the set of vectors in Rn such that uh, alpha dot V is non-negative for all simple roots and remember in this case with this choice of uh, irrational hyperplane this one and this one are the simple roots so why is this? Why do these give the same answer? Well, by the lemma we've just proved, um, any positive root can be written as a sum of simple roots. So if you have positive dot product with all the simple roots, you also have positive dot product with any positive combination of simple roots. And the positive roots are positive combinations of simple roots. So it automatically follows that you live inside this uh, other vial chamber or well, this vial chamber defined in this other way. Okay, next lemma. If alpha and beta are roots such that uh, alpha dot beta is negative, then alpha plus beta is a root. For example, uh, let's just go back up and look at a2, you can see these two simple roots here have negative dot product and their sum is this other positive root here.
I think I have to add in the assumption these are not collinear, so they don't lie on a line. So the proof of this lemma is going to be an exercise, but let me explain how the exercise goes. So you've got two roots, so you may as well just look at the span of those two roots, which would be a plane, a two-dimensional root diagram. And we've seen that the angles between the roots are constrained. Um, they have to be basically 90, 60, 45 or 30, or the kind of complementary angle. Uh, so, uh, you know, things like 120 degrees. Um, so there's going to be a case analysis, and because the dot product is strictly negative, the only cases we need to consider are um, 120 degrees, 135 degrees, and 150 degrees. Uh, so let's just have a look at the 120 degree case. Let's rescale one of the roots, say alpha, to have length 1. And let's look at beta. So if it makes 120 degrees, then it'll point off in this direction. And we know that the projection of beta to the horizontal line now, alpha, um, has to land at a half integer multiple of alpha. So maybe this is a half, or maybe beta is longer, and maybe this is one. But we also have to be able to project alpha onto the beta line and get a half integer multiple. Um, and okay, my diagram is not quite to scale. Basically, this distance is a half of this distance, uh, which means that we can't get out this far. So the only possibility is for beta also to have length one. So that means there's only one configuration of roots that has um, angle 120 degrees between them. And that is precisely this configuration of roots, both having length one and having angle 120. So now how do you prove the lemma for this case? Well, you just take the line, orthog oops, it's supposed to be a straight line, orthogonal to, um, one of the roots and the line orthogonal to the other root. It's maybe supposed to be more like this and this. And you reflect, and that's how you construct uh, this root here. In other words, you reflect uh, beta in the hyperplane orthogonal to alpha to get alpha plus beta. Okay, so it's a case analysis, and you've got three cases to analyze. Okay, next lemma. If alpha and beta are simple roots, then the dot product between alpha and beta is non-positive, so negative or zero. And the proof is, well, let's assume that it's positive. And we'll derive a contradiction. Well, if it's a positive dot product, then, well, we've got a lemma about negative dot product. So what we can do is uh, replace one of these roots, maybe beta, with minus beta. So then alpha dot minus beta is negative. And minus beta is still a root. It's a negative root now, but still a root. Uh, so we can apply the lemma previous lemma and what we get is uh, alpha minus beta is a root. Well if alpha minus beta is a positive root then uh, alpha equals alpha minus beta plus beta and these are both positive roots so alpha is a sum of positive roots so this says alpha is not simple, which is a contradiction to our assumption that alpha is simple. If uh, it's a negative root, which is the only other possibility, then, well, we can hit it with a minus sign and get a positive root. So beta minus alpha is positive. 
and beta equals beta minus alpha plus alpha and again this is a contradiction because beta is supposed to be a simple root so that proves the lemma. So this fact of this negativity of this dot product will be used uh, in a key way in the proof of the classification theorem but for now what we're getting from this is the following lemma which is that the simple roots are linearly independent. And that tells us there are at most n of them. So together with what we proved earlier, that says there are exactly n of them. Well, this lemma uh, proves quite nice. It follows from two facts. First is um, they all lie on one side of our chosen hyperplane of irrational slope. And the second fact is that they all have negative dot products with one another, or non-positive. So here's the proof. Let's suppose there's a linear dependence between them. Uh, sum of C alpha alpha. So the C alpha is a coefficient, so the alphas are the simple roots. And suppose this is equal to zero. Um, well, what, what are we going to do? Um, if all the C alphas are positive, or, you know, positive or zero, and at least one of them has to be strictly positive, otherwise this is not a linear dependence. Uh, then we get a contradiction because we're taking a sum of things, all of which lie on one side of a hyperplane, and we're taking positive coefficients, so we just get further and further away from the hyperplane. Um, so this is the contradiction. So some of them have to be negative. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to group them in the following way. We're going to take all the positive guys on the left-hand side, so this is where C alpha is positive. And we're going to take all the other ones onto the other side. Uh, so we get sum of C beta times beta, but now absolute value, where C beta is negative. Um, OK, so we can rewrite our linear independence in this form, just taking all the negative coefficients onto this side where they become positive. So what we're going to do is we're going to show that this is still equal to zero, so that actually we do get a positive combination of things that equal to zero. So that will give us a contradiction. So the claim is this is still equal to zero. And so let's call this something. Let's call it I don't know, v. And let's look at the length of v, v dot v. Well, v is equal to this sum of c alpha alpha. But it's also equal to sum of uh, absolute value C beta times beta, where this is over positive C alphas and this is over negative C betas, because it's the same vector, which is dotting it with itself and rewriting it in a different way. And now this is the sum, no, so double sum, of C alpha times absolute value of C beta, that's a positive number, times alpha dot beta, and that's a uh, negative or zero number so overall this is at most zero but v dot v is supposed to be at least zero so that says v has to be equal to zero right if v dot v is zero then v is zero so this says sum of c alpha alpha is where the c alphas are positive is still zero and that's now a contradiction Okay, so the output of all this is our simple roots are linearly independent, and that says there's at most n of them, so that means there is exactly n of them.